<clears throat> Father, we come before you, Lord. We thank you for your goodness and mercies. We know that your mercies are new every morning and great is your faithfulness. We thank you, Lord, for your love for us. Thank you for sending your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as our Savior. And Lord, certainly you didn't leave us in our helpless condition, but you drew us to yourself through the teaching of your word, the gospel message, and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And Father, we thank you, Lord, for that. We thank you for the ability to take in your word and understand your truth. We pray, Lord, that we might listen with positive volition, continue to help the believers here grow in your grace, and sanctify the believers here through your truth, because your word is truth. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, let's turn them to the book of John, John chapter 6, verse 44. John 6, 44. <coughs> no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. We started dealing with this text last time we were together, and certainly this indicates that those who come to Christ are drawn by uh, the Lord and those who place their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, he will resurrect them. Their resurrection is a certain guarantee. So we're going to talk about the drawing ministry of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I think this passage is misunderstood by Calvinists. Now Calvinists typically will use this passage to try to uh, teach irresistible grace irresistible grace. It's based on their system of the tulip that everyone that God has elected and those he died for, he only died for the elect, those individuals will be drawn irresistibly. But we will see that this drawing includes all, not simply the elect. This drawing can be resisted. So this drawing, first of all, the point we made last time is this drawing is resistible. So it's not irresistible grace. There are people who can reject the drawing of the Lord. Secondly, the drawing is not simply for a select few, but is for all. And there's passages supporting that in certainly John chapter 12. Uh, this drawing is available for all. It's for all. How does God draw? And that's the question. How does God draw individuals um, to the Savior, the Lord Jesus? Well, the drawing is through the gospel, certainly. Uh, the gospel message is the means or vehicle of the drawing ministry. And then fourth, that drawing must be responded to. So the person who is drawn to the Lord must respond to that message by faith. So there's human responsibility with this drawing. So God's doing a work here. Uh, he's The individuals who are coming to Christ, me is Christ in the context, the Father is, uses the drawing of the gospel, I think, certainly in the ministry of the Holy Spirit, convicting ministry, to draw individuals to himself. And those who respond by faith will be resurrected. And I think that's a summary of what this passage is teaching. The drawing is resistible. The drawing is for all. The drawing is through the gospel message. And the drawing must be responded to by faith. So, this word here for the word draw comes from this Greek word to draw toward without necessarily force. Now, last time we looked at another Greek word, suro, which the idea of dragging. Uh, Calvinists tried to take this term and say this is kind of an irresistible dragging uh, forcibly of individuals. Now, certainly in certain contexts when regarding physical objects, that can be the case. But here we're talking about people, people. Uh, and I think it's a word study fallacy to try to say, you know, he uses this term in regard to physical objects and that's how he forcibly drags individuals kicking and screaming against their will to uh, faith in him. And I don't think that's the case here. Um, studied this word and it's used of uh, fishing with nets that are thrown out and you hear a drag net is a net that you drag through the water and fish, the fish are caught in that net. And so it's kind of like a gracious thing. God 
throws out the net of salvation and individuals who respond are drawn to himself. And I think, I, I think that's a great picture. There's also an Old Testament picture of God drawing the nation of Israel through his love. So that's not a forcible thing. That's kind of a gracious thing. This drawing of the Lord is gracious. So he could have used the word sorrow that actually means more a dragging effect, but he didn't use that. As a matter of fact, these two um, words are in contrast in regard to the dragging or throwing out of the nets, dragging them through the water, drawing them, we could say, drawing them through the water versus when the nets were full, dragging them along the ground. It's more a forcible thing. You got to take effort to drag that net full of fishes on the ground. And I think that's an important contrast when he's using it as a physical objects, a drawing versus a dragging. But certainly this is not an irresistible type of thing as the Calvinists try to teach. So the drawing can be resisted. Now let's take a look at John chapter five, John chapter five. <clears throat> Jesus was telling uh, those who were rejecting him in chapter five, verse 40, this, but you are not willing to come to me that you might have life. Notice, he didn't say, not because I'm not dragging you against your will, he didn't say that uh, it wasn't because you were not elect from eternity past. It's not because I didn't die for you or will die for you at this point, but it says you are not willing. So the onus is on the individual. The responsibility on the individual is to respond to the scripture. Notice here, uh, verse 38, but you do not have his word abiding in you because whom he sent him you do not, do not believe. God sent his son Jesus, the Messiah, but they refused to believe in him. In verse 30, notice verse 39, he tells them to search the scripture. You search the scripture. He's talking about the Old Testament scripture. For in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they that testify of me. The Old Testament prophesied of a Messiah who would be born in Bethlehem. Micah 5, 2, the one who will be born of a virgin. Isaiah 7, 14, the one who would be crucified. Psalm 22, Isaiah 53, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Um, that Messiah is the Lord Jesus Christ. But they refuse to believe the testimony of their scripture. And so God gave them the means whereby they could believe, but they refused. They refused. So they resisted God's effort in drawing them to himself. So that drawing certainly can be resisted. God does not force people uh, to himself. God does not twist your arm and he make, to make you to believe. God simply gives you the message and you have the option to accept it or reject it. The gospel message can be rejected. God does not force this upon you. Unfortunately, that theological system of Calvinism uh, teaches a forcible drawing, forcible drawing to himself. Judas, by the way, was with Christ for over three years. He heard the message. He heard the truth, but he resisted it. More than likely, Judas was looking for a political savior instead of a spiritual savior. He wanted someone to overthrow Roman government. A lot of Jews in those days were looking for that type of Messiah. Certainly the Old Testament did predict of a righteous king that will rule over all the nations, but the timing though was not in his first coming. In his second coming, he will be that righteous king who will overthrow those earthly <coughs> governments and set up a kingdom beginning and centering in Jerusalem and rule and reign on the earth for a thousand years. But in his first coming, he came to die for the sins of the whole world. We see this in Romans chapter nine. So Judas resisted that intense drawing for over three years. All who die as unbelievers have rejected God's drawing. Think about that. All those who have rejected the gospel have rejected the drawing of God. God wants all to come to him. You know, the Lord's not willing that any should perish. God wants everyone to come to faith in him. But it's up to the individual. You can reject that, certainly. Now, those who do respond to that drawing are saved by grace through faith. Now, 
In this book by uh, Dr. A.J. Wall, The Truth About Election, he says this, No one will be lost because he has not been drawn to Christ. But many will be lost who fail to believe and yield to the drawing of Christ. And that's true. They'll, they do not respond to that drawing, and therefore they refused. Samuel Fisk, in his book, Election and Predestination, uh, which I highly recommend, he says this, God is drawing men heavenward, and the devil is drawing them hellward. Think about that. Satan certainly doesn't want individuals to believe in Jesus as the Messiah, and therefore he's drawing them in a different direction. But God desires to draw men heavenward. Now, um, Let's take a look at this. Augustinians see this as an irresistible drawing. This is possible, certainly, but not necessary. The BDAG lexicon lists a second meaning for this Greek word, helkuo, to draw a person in the direction of values for inner life, draw, attract. This was a figurative expression. Now, I'm going to read the whole thing, but what he's saying here when referring to people, the example is given in Jeremiah 31, verse 3. I have loved you with an everlasting love, therefore I have drawn you with loving kindness. Okay? So think about in a dating situation, how do you attract a potential mate? You don't grab them by the hair, say you're coming with me. <laughs> that's, that's really will not be responded to well. <laughs> no, the drawing can be with loving words, gracious action, kindness, and so that's how God draws us. He doesn't draw us and grab us by the head and pull us, uh, you know, or like some caveman dragging his woman on the ground, you know. It's not that, that's not how the Lord draws us. It's not irresistible. He does it with kindness. So I think that's a great passage in Jeremiah 31, 3 that shows how God draws. He draws us with his love. He draws us with his truth. He draws us with his message. And so we had the message of God's love for us through the gospel. And God is that way attracting us to himself. And so that's a good way to put it. Uh, he gives an example also of that type of love in Song of Solomon 1, 3, and 4. Therefore the maidens love you. Draw me after you and let us run together. He didn't say drag me with you. <laughs> Draw me after you and let us run together. And so that's an attraction of love. And so those examples in the Old Testament support this idea of kind of a gracious drawing to self. And in that sense, that's how the Lord attracts us and draws us to him. So how are people drawn to Christ? The context of John 6, 44 makes um, this, this was, these individuals were drawn by the testimony of Abraham, Moses, and the prophets. So one vehicle of drawing, as we will see here, is through the Word of God. Certainly the gospel message uh, is a means or vehicle of drawing. Now, this drawing is available for all in John 12, 32. Let's take a look at John chapter 12, verse 32. John 12, 32. Jesus here is anticipating his death on the cross. And so he's he knows he's about to die. He's planning on dying for the sins of the whole world. And he says, if I am lifted up from the earth. Now the lifting up was literally lifting up that wooden cross, placing it in the ground. He was above the earth on that cross. He says, if I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. Notice that. He will draw all peoples to himself. And certainly he died for the sins of the whole world. We see this in this, his substitutionary death on the cross. Jesus Christ died in our place. He was lifted up. And then that lifting up and that payment for sin will be the means of bringing people to himself. And therefore, that drawing is available for all. Tom Constable said this, Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension would draw all people without distinction not all people without exception to himself. It would make all people savable in the sense that his death would reconcile the world of humanity to God. It would remove the barrier of real guilt that made people inaccessible to God. This, that guilt and that barrier 
is removed so that individuals could come by faith to him. Now, God uses the means of the gospel. Certainly, no one can be saved apart from believing that good news or that message. And that's why the urgency of proclaiming that truth to all the world. Um, no individual is going to be saved unless they hear that good news, that message, the gospel centering in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Uh, even though, the, Zane Hodges said this, even though it is a horrific instrument of death, the Father uses the cross to draw or attract people to Jesus and his promise. So the cross is the means and vehicle of attracting people to himself. He says this, this corresponds to John 20, 31. These eight signs, those gospel signs, are written to you that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. John emphasizes the signs, especially the cross and resurrection, designed to draw people to faith in Jesus as the Christ, the life-giving Son of God. So the cross is the means and vehicle whereby God will draw people to himself. And certainly that is the core of the gospel message, that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day. He gives eternal life to those who place their faith in him. And so God uses that means of the gospel so that people might believe. In John chapter 6, verse 44, John 6, 44 and 45, notice the following verse. So we have the verse, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draw him. I will raise him up with the last day. But then look at verse 40, 45, the following verse. It is written in the prophets, they shall all be taught by God. So he quotes an Old Testament example that emphasizes the teaching of the scripture. Therefore, everyone who has heard, you hear the message, and learn from the Father comes to me. So you have to hear the message of the scripture. Uh, and that think, certainly is the message of the gospel in order to be drawn to the Savior or drawn to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let's take a look at John 16, verse 8. So God uses the vehicle of the scripture. I think also he uses, in the church age, he uses the means of the Holy Spirit. We have a particular ministry of the Holy Spirit toward the lost. Now, certainly there's many things that the Holy Spirit has done for us as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. When we place our faith in Christ, we have four permanent ministries of the Holy Spirit represented by, you know this, ribs. R-I-B-S, regeneration. That's mean, that means simply to give you eternal life when you believe the gospel. Indwelling, you're permanently indwelt by the Holy Spirit. B, you're baptized by the Holy Spirit. And then S, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. But here though, in this passage, in John 16, we have the Holy Spirit's work in, in dealing with people who are not born again. What does he do? Well, this is how he draws people to himself. Look at this. In John 16, verse 8, And when he has come, he's anticipating the arrival of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. When he has arrived, he will convict the world of sin. So these are unsaved individuals. The world. Notice, the world of humanity. He will convict them of sin, singular, and of righteousness, and of judgment. Now, what sin does the Spirit convict of? You think people think, well, he'll convict me that I'm a drunkard or I'm immoral or I'm a liar or all that. No. Notice what the following verse, what sin does the Spirit of God focus upon? Verse 8, of sin because they do not believe in me. That is the one sin that's keeping you out of heaven, unbelief. So it's not all these other sins that you could list. It's one sin, your lack of faith. So if you don't believe the gospel, that's the, that's the barrier that stands between you and eternity. So once you believe the gospel by faith, you're born again. The Spirit convicts you. Hey, you haven't believed in Jesus Christ as Savior. You need to do that. And that's the Spirit working on the heart of the unsaved person, drawing him to himself. 
So in response to the gospel, which is verbalized, in that ministry of the Holy Spirit, I think are those two are the two means whereby God is drawing individuals to himself through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the drawing is through the gospel message. And the Spirit of God will convince individuals that their sin of unbelief is a barrier between them and God. They don't have the righteousness which they need to order, in order to go to heaven. They need imputed righteousness by faith. And if they don't, if they reject that message, they will be judged. So sin, righteousness, and judgment. Now, once those individuals respond to the gospel by faith, we have the guarantee of a future resurrection. And the resurrection is not simply a general resurrection. He's talking here about believers. Now, in the context that we looked at the last time, this is the resurrection of Old Testament saints. He's talking immediately to those Jews here who are anticipating the future resurrection, as Daniel did in Daniel 12, of the resurrection at the last day before the kingdom begins. But certainly this is true of all believers, even the church age. God will resurrect those who are drawn to him by faith, those who respond to him in the gospel. So once again, those who have believed the gospel have a guaranteed resurrection. It repeats it several times in this section. I will raise him up at the last day. I will raise him up at the end of the last day. Over and over, he repeats that certainty. So in realizing that he is simply summarizing what Paul said later, uh, those he justified, them he also glorified. Those who are declared righteous will be glorified, they will be resurrected, uh, and that is a certainty in God's mind. So what does that teach? Eternal security. No one is lost between that day of believing the gospel and that future day of resurrection. And that should give confidence to the believer. The Father draws people to the Son by teaching them. Now, we saw in verse 45 it is written in the prophets, and I think he's quoting from Isaiah and Jeremiah. And sometimes when the scripture is quoted from the Old Testament, it's not quoted word for word or verbatim, but it's quoted in summary form, drawing principles out of the Old Testament scriptures. So sometimes you'll see it not exactly word for word, but he's summarizing truth uh, from the Old Testament scripture. And so he says, it's th this principle, the scripture is, they shall be all taught by God. They shall all be taught by God. Uh, we have something similar to that in Isaiah chapter 54. Isaiah chapter 54, verse 13. Isaiah 54, verse 13. All your children shall be taught by the Lord. Now, ultimately, he's referring here to that future kingdom when the Lord Jesus Christ will reign. But that's really not his point. He's simply at this point saying that this is the means of drawing individuals to himself by instructing them. And that's available for all. This instruction is available for all. All your children shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. And then the new covenant promise in Jeremiah 31, Jeremiah 31, verse 34. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. And so they will all know me. They'll have an internal awareness of who the Lord is. Once again, that's a new covenant promise related to Israel and the kingdom, but the principle drawn from that verse is the fact that they'll be all taught by God. And therefore, it's through the message that they're drawn to the Lord. Now, uh, Robbie Dean says this in his notes, the context of Isaiah 54 is that this prediction of what will take place in the millennial kingdom when Messiah comes, and it emphasizes the ultimate source of learning spiritual truth. We are taught of God. How do we learn spiritual truth? Because God teaches it to us. Man on his own cannot understand the things of God, because we are spiritually brain dead, and it is God the Holy Spirit who makes these things clear to us. 
God, the Holy Spirit, functions at the moment of God consciousness as a human spirit. Jesus is not interpreting the passage. He's just quoting it to establish his point that ultimately people learn spiritual truth directly from God. And that's the point from this quote here. And so we need to learn spiritual truth from God. And therefore, it's the Spirit of God which illuminates the need for the Savior. Now, Samuel Fix says this in his book on election and predestination. We have a teacher who is willing to give his blessing to all and pours out his heavenly teaching upon all. God draws all who are willing to be drawn. God draws all who are willing to be drawn. And the idea of being taught by God is being given gospel information from the scripture. Now, we have that principle in Romans chapter 10. <coughs> That faith comes by hearing, and hearing by what? The word of God. So we need the good news from the scripture in order to place our faith. We need content. How shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? Remember, we've taught this in reverse order as far as you believe first, and then you call in a relationship with the Lord in prayer. So that's referring to the Christian who responds to God in prayer. It's a Calling on God is a familiar term to address the Lord as a believer in prayer. Uh, that occurs after you're born again. But how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? You had to believe first. What happens before that? How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? You had to hear about him before you believe. How shall they hear without a messenger? You need someone who gives you the message to listen to and believe. So it goes backwards here. How shall they preach unless they are sent? You need someone commissioned to go, preach a message, and then those individuals respond and listen to it, and then they believe. And therefore, verse 16, the problem is with the unbelief of those who hear. They have not all obeyed the gospel. Now, what is obeying the gospel? It's not salvation by commitment or promises or anything like that. It's not, uh, you know, committing your life to Christ. I hear this term all the time. I committed my life to Christ. Well, that's great if you're a Christian. That's not what you need to do in order to be saved. Uh, you need to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Uh, they have not all obeyed the gospel. Well, the text says what that means. Isaiah says, Lord, who hath believed our report? That's a quote from Isaiah 53, and in that chapter, he talks about the message or report about the Messiah who would die and rise from the dead. That's the record that they haven't believed. And so all we like sheep have gone astray and turned everyone to his own way. The Lord hath laid on him, the substitute, the iniquity of us all. And therefore, that good news message is not responded to by faith. Well, then how does faith arrive? Verse 17. So then faith comes by what? Hearing. And hearing by what? The word of God. All right? How, I want faith. Great. Faith comes by what? Hearing. And hearing by what? Word of God. See? And you need to hear the message in the Bible about Jesus Christ, the one who died and rose from the dead to give you eternal life. You respond by believing. Hearing means you willingly yield and believe that truth. So the being taught by God is being positive toward gospel information, pure and simple. And therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. So you need to hear and learn. The hear is the word akuo. Jesus said, you have ears to hear, let them hear. We get the word acoustics, by the way. I think there's a related French word, and uh, I'm not going to try to pronounce it because I never had French, but I know the word in the English, acoustics. Um, I think the French teacher begins, listen with a French word, that French word is similar to the English for acoustics. But the idea, listen, is to listen up. I always like, I like hearing Charles Stanley because every, you know, four or five minutes, he uses the word listen. Listen, listen. 
And he said that because people tend to fade out in the middle of the message. And so brings them back. Listen, listen, listen. So everyone who has heard and then who has learned, that means understand and comprehend the truth that is heard. Let's take a look at John chapter 10. John chapter 10, verse 17. Uh, let's see, well, uh, notice verse 27, not 17, 27. My sheep hear my voice. And that's the first step. Jesus Christ calls through the gospel and the sheep respond. That's a vivid picture of the sheep listening to the shepherd. They respond to that shepherd's voice. And I know them and they follow me. Follow me means respond by faith. Parallel that with John 5, 24. It'd be, if you want some homework there, <laughs> take John, 5, uh, John 10, 27, and parallel John 5, 24, and you'll see it hearing is believing. Uh, in John 5, 27, 28, those two passages compared to John 5, 24. And then what? What's the order? It didn't say I give them eternal life and they follow me. He says, they follow me, and then I give them eternal life. So that following means respond to the gospel message by faith. And then they shall never perish. They're secure. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my Father's hand. They're now they're under the care of the good shepherd. And guess what? The good shepherd loses how many people? None. None. All right, Matthew chapter 11, verse 15. So it comes by the sheep listening to the voice of the shepherd. Matthew chapter 11. Verse 15. Matthew 11, verse 15. This is simple and to the point. <laughs> Jesus said, He who has ears to hear, do what? Let him hear. <laughs> you have ears to hear the gospel? Listen. Let him hear. Respond to that message by faith. So everyone who has heard and then learned. Now you can hear something without learning, right? Just like Charlie Brown's teacher. Womp, 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 womp. <laughs> it's just noise to you. If you don't respond to what is being taught. And therefore the word mathano, manthano means to come to understand as a result of learning. And I think this is emphasizing your response to the message. <laughs> So you hear the message, and it's not simply mouthing words. It's, yes, that's what I need to do. I need to place my faith in Christ. And therefore, you respond by faith. Look at John chapter 5, verse 24. John 5, 24. Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and does what? Believes in him who sent me, has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment in the future but has passed out of a state of death into a state of life. So the idea is you respond to the, to the message. Now the one who hears and learns comes to me. That means embraces Christ as the Messiah. So he says everyone who's heard and learned responds with positive volition to the gospel believes in Jesus as the Messiah. So I think clearly that drawing is through the message of the gospel, and it's available for all. Now, verse 46, nor that, not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. This points to an intimate relationship between the Father and the and the Son shared by no one else. Jesus is unique. Why do we need to believe in Jesus? Because he is unlike any one of us. He, in one sense, is a human being, but yet he is divine. He is the God-man. He is the one who is given by God the Father. He preexisted his birth, and he had an eternal relationship with the Heavenly Father. The first verse 
of the Gospel of John states this, that um, in John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But you know what? Jesus did not remain in heaven. God sent his Son to earth to take on human flesh so that he would ultimately be lifted up and die on a cross for our sins so that he would make payment for sin and we can have eternal life through faith in him. And so Jesus is pointing out to the crowd here his uniqueness. No one has this type of relationship with the Father as I do. I think that's really what he's saying here. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he was from God. And who's that? Jesus says, me. I'm from God. And he has seen the Father. He was with the Father from all eternity. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Notice in John chapter 1, verse 18. John 1, 18. No one has seen God at any time. Now, this is obviously referring to his entire essence. You say, well, Moses saw God and others saw God. He saw the, the Bible uses kind of a anthropomorphic terms. The backside of God, in a sense, God put Moses in the cleft of the rock. And he's going to pass, you know, can't see his full glory. But really, God can personalize himself and reveal himself. But to see him filling heaven and earth. No one has ever seen God in his full essence. But the Father was with God, the Father, from eternity past. And that's pretty astounding when you think about it. No one has seen God at any time, but the only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, that refers to relationship, he has exegeted him. So in the sense that we don't see God visibly, Jesus took on human flesh so that we could understand the nature and character of God. It's one of the reasons why he took on flesh. So we know that God is loving. We can see Jesus Christ manifesting love. We can see Jesus Christ manifesting mercy. We can see Jesus Christ manifesting justice. And therefore we can understand something. We can comprehend something about God's character through Jesus visibly showing us God. So Jesus certainly is affirming here his absolute deity and his absolute equality with the Father. Christ is the one who reveals God the Father to man. And so Jesus is equating absolute equality with God the Father. Now we have this quote from William Temple. William Temple speaks of an error that must be at once repelled, the alluring peril of mysticism according to which a man may have direct experience of unmediated communion with the infinite and eternal God. That is not so. Any experience taken to this is wrongly interpreted. Only the Son has that direct communion with the Father. See, a people that claimed to have seen God and had a mystical experience with God, no, no one has seen him except the one who came from him. So I think we, this certainly has another intention here, refuting that mystical view of people saying, you know, even Jesus said, I'm not going to reveal myself until I come in the second coming. Uh, you're not going to see me henceforth until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So people claiming to see Jesus at the foot of their bed or had this mystical experience or vision. By the way, that's one of the contradictions of the Christian way of life is mysticism. And the book of Colossians warns us against mysticism. And therefore, we have to guard against visions and individuals who claim to have seen God or God speaks to him or children who claim that they have died and gone into heaven and reveal what John the Apostle did not reveal. Think about that. John the Apostle who wrote the last book of the Bible and spoke of the glories of heaven. You have a little 12 old your old boy claiming mystical visions that even John the Apostle hasn't seen. We don't, I don't take credibility in that. I take credibility in the book of Revelation and what the Bible speaks. And the Bible says not to add to God's word or take away from the word of God. God has given to us all things that pertain unto what? Life and godliness through the scripture, right? 
So I believe in what is called the sufficiency of Scripture. The Scripture is enough for me to live the Christian life. I don't need some mystical testimony of some claimed vision of God in order to believe the truth of the Bible. As a matter of fact, Jesus even told Peter, who saw Christ, blessed are those who haven't seen and yet do what? Believe, believe. And therefore I take the credibility of God's word. Uh, and therefore I'm more blessed because I agree with him I love not having seen, as Peter writes. Now, so that's just one point about John 40, 46. Now, I think I'll say this for next time, but let's just deal with um, the doctrine of bibliology that comes from this. Let me show you something real quick here. We need to distinguish between these three aspects, revelation, inspiration, and illumination. We are no longer receiving direct revelation from God. Understand that. No one can claim now that God is revealing direct truths to them. Otherwise, we'd have additional scripture. The canon is closed. That scripture that God revealed, various authors wrote. And that's why the byproduct is inspired. Not the individuals inspired. God guided them. But the word that they wrote is inspired, which is all scripture is God breathed, 2 Timothy 3.16. Today, though, we can understand what has been already revealed and inspired, and that's where illumination comes in. I understand the scripture as it's accurately taught, rightly divided, and by the Holy Spirit, I can comprehend in my thinking what God already, already revealed and what God already inspired. So this is a very important distinction in bibliology between revelation, inspiration, and illumination. God's not giving additional revelation today. Therefore, I believe in the completion of the Word of God, the 66 canonical books which God revealed to authors and has inspired the Word of God. Now I need to study what has already been revealed. Why does God need to give me more scripture when I have enough to study? Just even reading through the Bible one year is a challenge. So I have all that's necessary for me to live a godly life and what he has revealed. The secret things belong to the Lord. The things he's revealed belong to us and his children. And therefore, the scripture is sufficient. I want to leave you certainly with the good news of the gospel. And so... The Lord Jesus Christ came to this earth to die for us. And this is our transition into communion. Every once in a while, I want to go over the gospel. And so the question here is if you should die today. And hopefully, I remember telling the at uh, camp the children this, hopefully that's not the case. <laughs> hopefully that is not the case. But it, at least a question that makes you think, okay? Where am I headed after death? Where am I going? Would you be 100% certain that you would wake up in heaven if you respond saying, well, I'm a pretty good person. I'm kind of have a good chance. Uh, if you don't know 100%, then you, know, you don't have salvation because God doesn't leave you with a 50% chance or a 60% chance or 99% chance. He wants you to be 100% certain. Now, the bad news is that all of us have sinned, and therefore we're guilty before a holy God. Sin acts as a barrier between us and God, and therefore the reason why God cannot accept us because, is because we're sinners. And this includes everyone. All have sinned. Everyone, including myself. I'm a sinner, but saved by God's grace, we've all sinned and come short of God's glory. Man's sin is a barrier between him and God. And God's holy cannot allow sin into heaven. That's why God sent his son Jesus. Jesus came to pay the penalty of our sin. Therefore, our sins were placed upon Jesus. And therefore, he became our substitute. He paid the full price for the sins of the whole world. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. He was buried. He rose again the third day according to the scripture. The scripture he was quoting was the Old Testament. Isaiah 53, study that. Psalm 22, 
uh, Psalm 1610, passages concerning his substitutionary death and resurrection. You're not saved by being good. You can try to be good enough, but God will not let you into heaven through your good works. We can never do enough to earn eternal life. The Bible says it's not a work, so any man should boast. Attending church, being baptized, feeding the poor, these works will not save you. We're saved by grace. Grace means undeserved favor. Ephesians 2, 8. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. You need to place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who took the punishment for your sins, and then wants to give you eternal life as a free gift. Salvation's not worked for, it's not earned, it's simply given as a free gift. A gift is something that someone else paid for that you freely receive. And the receiving of the gift of eternal life is by placing your faith in Jesus for eternal life. When does eternal life begin? Not when you die, but the moment you believe. And therefore, it's permanent. I give them eternal life. They shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Because we have that promise, those who have placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for eternal life, you can be 100% certain that when you die, you'll wake up in heaven. 1 John 5, 13, these things I've written to you that you believe in the name of the Son of God that you might know that you have eternal life. I don't have to doubt it. I can know it because God promised that to me. If you've done that, you're born again. I'm not asking you to walk an aisle. I'm not asking you to raise your hand. I'm not asking you to be, to be baptized or join the church or give money to the church or do good works or do anything else. Place your faith alone in Christ alone period. And when you do that, you're born again. And that's good news. Now let's transition into communion. Communion is simply a reminder of what Christ did on the cross. It's a reminder of that message. So before we begin with communion, I want to ask just briefly some prayer requests, and we're going to pray We'll be dismissed after communion, but do <coughs> congregational prayer just briefly. Prayer request. <coughs> prayer request. James? I'm scared of the country. <laughs> Pray for our nation. Absolutely. All the world leaders are looking at us. Okay. All right. Other prayer requests?